Okay. Just want to read one um, verse and then we'll we'll start. Okay. I'd like us to. Um, Turn to um, yeah, Second Peter and Chapter Three, verse eighteen. Okay, Second Peter Chapter Three, verse eighteen. Okay. This is what it says, right? It says, uh, "But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever." Uh, the verses before that, it's, it talks about how we need to be diligent, to be found in peace, to be found blameless, to be without spot. Okay? And verse 17 says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace of and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's saying, you know, uh, just watch out so that you don't fall away from your steadfastness. Okay. Steadfastness meaning, you know, you are established, you are consistent, okay? but watch out that you don't move away from that place of being steadfast, of being consistent. And uh, verse 18 is almost like an antidote, right? It's it's like an answer to this, like he's, he's giving. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so uh, in our own spiritual lives, you know, we just come to that place of saying, God, you know, I don't want to be, you know, in a sense, um, I don't want to be content, right, with status quo. Okay? Meaning, I don't want to stay stay where I am. Because actually, there is no place of staying where we are, right? Either we will go back or we need to go forward. Okay? So the steadfastness is about growing. The steadfastness is about moving forward, growing in the grace, growing in the knowledge and understanding of our Lord Jesus. And that's our pursuit, right, as followers of the Lord Jesus. Whether we are in ministry, whether we are not in ministry, you know, that doesn't matter at all, you know, uh, in so-called full-time ministry. But as believers, as disciples of the Lord Jesus, this is our responsibility, that we grow in the grace, that we grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, So why don't we just pray uh, on these lines and say, Lord, we want to grow. Lord, I want to grow. You know, I just want, don't want to remain uh, in this place. Um, or in this place of um, spirituality or maturity, but I want to grow. I want to grow more. I want to grow in your knowledge. I want to grow in your grace. Come, let's pray in our own words. Maybe you can just pray, talk to the Lord and say, Lord, cause me to grow. You could say, Lord, Spirit of God, <clears throat> you enable me, you strengthen me, pour out your spirit. Lord, you lead me. Now, the Lord Jesus says that um, the Holy Spirit, you know, he will lead us into all truth and the truth will set us free and free from what is holding us back, free from what is uh, withholding us, free from all those barriers, right? from all those shackles, from all those chains, um, even things that are holding us back from growing into the likeness of Christ. Okay, the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth. So um, let's pray that and saying, Lord, you lead me into the truth. You lead me in the truth so that I understand what the truth is, so that I can walk in the truth, that I may grow in the grace and the knowledge of Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you that, uh, for this, for these words of instructions, God, for this exhortation. And uh, Lord, we ask that 
<clears throat> that you would pour out your spirit and by your spirit and with our relationship with you, God, uh, with our fellowship with the Holy Spirit, with our communion with the Holy Spirit, that uh, we may be led into truth, that we may be established into truth and that we will continue to grow in the grace and knowledge, God, that we will not remain where we are, that we will not be satisfied with where we are, O oh God, but that we will grow uh, and uh, more and more, Father God, and, and that we will grow in power, that we will grow in understanding, and may we grow in Christ-likeness, may we grow to be like you, God. We thank you. And to this end, Holy Spirit, help us, lead us. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, okay, that's uh, you know uh, that's a wonderful prayer to pray. Uh, we know that it's in line with scripture. It's in line with the will of God. Okay, and there are many such prayers, right? Uh, where Paul prays for the church. Right? It's in Ephesians, and we see in in, in the epistles where Paul writes and uh, and he prays for the church, prays for the believers, and we can actually make that our declaration. You know. Like Paul says, beloved, I pray that you would, uh, like John says, you know, I pray that you may prosper and be in health, um, you know, just as your soul prospers. And you can make that your confession. You can make that your declaration. Lord, I pray that I may prosper and be in health just as my soul prospers, right? Okay, let's, um, uh, let's continue from where we uh, stopped last class. Does anyone remember where we stopped? <clears throat> where did we stop last class? Sorry. Yeah, we, we went past uh, church history, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in <clears throat> in church history. Okay, so we went through uh, the timeline, 400 AD, you know, till 2000, and you know, all the wonderful truth uh, the Holy Spirit is uh, restoring into the church. And after that, we look, looked at something very important. Sorry? Mm. So uh, the work of the Holy Spirit we saw um, in a believer's life. That's what we. That's where we stopped, right? In a believer's life, and uh, one of the things that He does is gives us the Holy Spirit gives us the assurance of sonship, right? meaning that He gives testifies to us that we are sons and daughters of God. Okay, so uh, no one can reason it. With us, no man need to, no human being needs to reason. But the Holy Spirit Himself, He reasons. He gives us the proof. He gives us the evidence. Okay, um, so we stop there. And before that, we saw that chapter uh, or uh, topic seven, chapter seven. We saw work of the Holy Spirit towards the sinner. Right? Uh, he does the work of convicting. Okay? So we see that He convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Right? Very important work. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Right? He's the one who brings conviction. Okay, so even as um, you know, as believers, as ministers of God, so we don't have to put ourselves under pressure to bring that conviction. Of course, we will use the wisdom that God gives. We will use the words that God gives. We will use our abilities, our testimony, and everything to share. But the actual work of convicting people's hearts is the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? So that's something that we saw. Okay, and then we looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. Okay, and we started by looking at how the Holy Spirit, it is He who brings about change in the inner man. Okay, the work of regeneration. Right? What happened to us when we were born again? We looked at that, right? And many of you said, okay, we are forgiven, our sins are forgiven. Uh, and uh, we also saw that uh, you know we are made new as new creation, uh, and you know our past is taken away, the old is taken away, and the all that, the regeneration, the new creation, right, the born again spirit is because of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who does the work. So which means that I cannot will myself to be a new creation. In the sense, I can't psych myself. To be a new creation, right? Like, uh, okay, I'll say, okay, uh, I, I want to follow the Lord Jesus. Let me do these steps one, two, three, four, uh, and uh, you know, I'm a new creation. No, you know, I what I do is just receive by faith. I receive salvation. We receive salvation 
by faith right because you receive it because it's freely given it's by grace through faith so we receive it but the work of regeneration there's something very significant very deep very precious that the holy spirit does he does it in our hearts right he there's, there's no other human being can do that right no self help book can do that you know have you read any self help books okay uh, like uh, about increasing your memory power about managing your time you know these are good good things managing your time maybe improving uh, your language improving your presentation skills there are many self help books you know um, like especially in the railway station if you go you know there are many books that they keep you know magazines books and and people just grab it and you know general knowledge and you will see a lot of self help books next time when you go home for your vacation you know you you check out there'll be many self help books you know general knowledge how to pass ias exam uh, iits and you know uh, and then these things will be there you know how to increase your memory power increase your language how to win friends and influence people you know uh, dale carnegie um, all these books will be there so no amount of self help can actually change our spirit it will definitely make us you know these things are useful to train our minds they will you know they will change our thinking therefore our behavior but our spirit will remain unchanged if not for the work of the holy spirit if not for you know uh, salvation that's something we need to understand so something amazing happened to us when we were born again okay, we need to uh, we need to realize that we need to understand that you know it's not like i just made a decision and and i'm here you know in the bible college training no something amazing happened something supernatural happened something very special happened and that was because of the work of the holy spirit and you gave permission right you gave permission you said okay lord i invite you to come into my heart i change my life right you prayed that prayer or you maybe didn't didn't even voice it but you thought about it and then god responded okay so we see that the work of regeneration is by the holy spirit Yeah, that's why we stopped. Um, uh, we stopped. Uh, he gives us the assurance of sonship. Okay, so in everyday life, we see that the Holy Spirit works in the hearts of the believer, in the life of the believer. Okay, there's something that He's doing. We we might not be even mindful of it, that right? we may not be even aware of it, right? But He is doing the work because He indwells us, right? Um, let's look at a few uh, scriptures. Okay. If you're following in your notes, we are in chapter eight, right? Work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life, and we are looking at in everyday life. What does He do? Okay, let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter one and verse twenty-two. Okay, Second Corinthians one verse twenty-two, Ephesians one thirteen, Ephesians four. So all these uh, scriptures talk about you know a, a particular thing, um, something that the Holy Spirit did. Okay, one and verse twenty-two. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-two. It says, "He, um, sorry, uh, let's me let me read uh, verse twenty-one and twenty-two. Now he who has establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee." okay he has sealed us and given us uh, the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee okay so what does that sealed us mean okay the word used there is the word uh, which means sfragizo uh, sfragizo which means in greek it's a signet ring okay signet ring like when you see if you um, in the olden days uh, the, the monarchy the king or the queen will have a signet ring you know uh, have you seen in the post office um you know now post offices are very few but in the post office they put that seal okay and uh, they they melt that red color wax right and then it will form a kind of a liquid thing and then they put a seal there you know there's a emblem there okay uh, and also you know uh, if somebody let's say uh, there's a crime scene crime uh, crime scene sorry and uh, they'll seal that door okay, which means the gum nobody has authority to open it except the one who uh, put that seal okay one who gives permission is the one who put the seal right 
so uh, kings and queens you know had this ring and they, so they'll put that so it, it it's called a signet ring okay so th the same word is used there that we have been sealed by the holy spirit god by sending the holy spirit and the holy spirit because of his indwelling us it is the seal of ownership so it's each of us carry that mark, that seal of ownership. What is that ownership? Who's the owner? Yeah, absolutely. He's the one who purchased us by his precious blood. So we belong to him. So each of us carry that seal of ownership. And uh, the seal of ownership is the Holy Spirit. Okay. The second thing that we see there in the same verse is that and who has given us the heart, a spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Okay. And that word is also an interesting word. Okay. Um, so that word means, uh, in, in Old English, it will be a word called earnest. Okay. Earnest or guarantee. In today's contemporary language, it would mean a down payment. Okay. So when you buy something in, on installment, right? let's say you're buying a two-wheeler, you need to pay a down payment, right? Maybe 50% or maybe more of the cost of the vehicle. You need to pay as a down payment. See, that's the assurance that, you know, and the vehicle is yours. But you need to pay that installment so that the vehicle becomes fully yours. Okay. So that's the that same idea or the same word is used there, earnest, okay, or a down payment. So who is the earnest? The Holy Spirit in our her hearts is a earnest or the down payment or a guarantee for what like we are already belonging to him the guarantee that we are the purchased position we belong to him and there will be a full redemption at the coming of christ there'll be a full redemption right when is the full redemption made when the payment is full right now the payment has already been made but there we are spirit soul and body we are redeemed fully at the coming of christ Okay, and a, and a very interesting Greek word, Arabon. Okay, that's the word which is used there. And uh, interestingly, in modern Greek, like today, uh, you know, that that word, uh, Arabon, has actually uh, evolved and changed, and uh, they they use it to signify the engagement ring. Okay, so what is an engagement ring? Ring, engagement ring. What does it mean? Engaged means what? <laughs> engaged means engaged. <laughs> okay, so engaged means that uh, Hindi mein kya bolte bhaiya? Huh? Sagai. Okay, so that that's not uh, uh, marriage, right? What happens before the marriage? Okay, so it's a promise that one day you will get married. Okay, they are promising each other, saying, "Okay, today I make a promise that in the in, in on this day or or one day, pretty soon in the future, we will be married." Okay. So that same uh, word is used for the engagement ring. Okay. So, in fact, the Lord is saying that you know in the Bible we see there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb, but the, we are the bride of Christ, the church, and uh, the bridegroom Jesus is coming back for the bride. So He's saying we are engaged. And coming back, there's a promise, promise of the second coming. So all that, you know, it, it signifies that, right? So the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells us is a promise of what is to come, right? We are, in fact, the bride of Christ. So all those wonderful things are in that one verse, you know, it has so much of meaning, okay? Um, let's look at the other a couple of verses also. Uh, let's look at Ephesians 1 and verse 13. Okay, let me quickly read Ephesians 1.13. It says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? So verse 14 brings it out very clearly. Okay, that the Holy Spirit in us, you know, he's, we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit 
uh, with the Holy Spirit of promise, and he is the guarantee. He is the down payment. He is the earnest until the full redemption of the purchased possession. Right? Okay, so that's the assurance that we have as believers that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee. So the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit signifies all this. Okay, maybe we might have questions, you know, when will Jesus come? You know, it's already been so many years. You know, will, will he come? The fact that you and I have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is pointing to that promise. He's saying that uh, he's the guarantee of the full redemption of the purchase position. And the full redemption happens when he comes again. Right? So we don't have to be in doubt. We don't have to be anxious. Well, he indwells us, and it is like the engagement ring. Right? So when when you get engaged, you know, I, I remember um, when I got engaged, you know, my wife's mother, my mother-in-law, uh, you know, uh, father-in-law, I mean, uh, her husband passed away. Now, uh, my mother-in-law, she was a little anxious, right? So because uh, I I knew my you know wife now for about four or five years before we got married, right? you know, knew her as a friend and this thing. So every time I'll go home, visit and talk and also she'll get very agitated, you know, will he marry you or not? You know, <laughs> she'll ask, well, uh, will he finally marry you or not? Then she'll ask me, you know, so Jake Mar, uh, you know, what are your plans? And I, you know, and wantedly, I'll be talking about my professional, this thing, you know, I'll be talking about work and but she'll actually want to know what are your plans, you know, regarding my daughter? You know, when, what, when is it going to happen? But I'll be talking about you know this and that, and you know just teasing, um, you know avoiding the whole topic of marriage. But you know there's this anxiety in her. So finally, when we got engaged, I could see that she was at peace. Right? She was at peace. No, no more anxiety. Okay, finally we're engaged. I know that he's going to get you know married to her. Okay, so visually, you know, I could see it on her face. The same way, we don't have to be, you know, we don't have to be anxious. If we are anxious, we don't have to be, you know, about the second coming of Christ, about what's going to happen, you know, because he's already promised. And that promise is signified by his presence in our lives, by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay, let's move on. Okay, let's move on to the next one. The Holy Spirit helps us to live a life of holiness. What is his name? Holy Spirit. Okay. His name is Holy Spirit. And so he comes in to make us holy. Okay. He indwells us to make us holy. So, you know, many times we think, no, oh, I need to become holy in order to have the Holy Spirit work in me. I need to become holy in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But in scripture, you see it's the other way around. He comes in whatever state we are, whatever condition we are, he comes and works in us to make us holy. Right? He's not looking for very holy, perfect people to come and dwell in. No, he's saying, no, I will come and dwell and I will make the changing, I'll make the renovation, I'll make the repairs, I'll do the painting, you know, I'll do the I'll I'll change everything. I'll do the makeover. Right? So he enables us to walk in holiness okay um if you look at uh, you know chapters um, uh, especially roman chapter 6 7 8 you can go through it you can read it it talks about the work of the holy spirit who enables us to crucify or put to death the things of the flesh okay he he enables us and why does he do that so that you and i can live a holy life okay? so, he, so so we see that God does not require of us to do things, you know, out of our own will. Our, yeah, 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 of course, our will is involved, but you know, out of our own strength, out of our own ability. No, you know, yes, our will is involved. We need to make a choice. We need to desire to live a holy life. But He's saying that He will come, empower, and enable us to live a holy life. Right. So you see this whole aspect of salvation and uh, and you know the work of the Holy Spirit is something wonderful for the believer. It's wonderful for each one of us. He comes to work in us 
to change us and to live a holy life. Okay, let's look at Romans chapter 8. Okay, you can read 6 and 7. But if you look at Romans 8, um, it it is it, it, some, something very important. Okay, um, 8 and verse 5. Okay, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Okay, so that's what verse 5 says. Um, uh, and it says, for to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death. Right? It brings death. It destroys. Um, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Okay, Let's go down to uh, uh, verse 11. Okay, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead would also give life to your mortal, mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Okay. So what do we see here? Verse 13 especially it says that if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, what does that mean? If by the Spirit led by the Spirit, with the help of the Spirit, right? Uh, uh, according to the empowering, the plans of the Holy Spirit. If by the Spirit, okay, that's first thing, by the Holy Spirit, so it's not without the Holy Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit, what is the second part? Yeah, if by the Spirit, you put to death. Okay. So it, it involves the Holy Spirit, big part, right? If, if by His plan, by His empowering. But who is going to put to death? Who is going to bring to a close? I'm, my, I'm involved. I'm responsible. Right? It says, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Okay. So the Holy Spirit is going to lead us to put to death the deeds of the body. So what does put to death mean? Execute. Right? Execution. Meaning bring to an end. Bring to an end. Bring what to an end? Sorry? Yeah, fleshly things which cause us to sin. Okay. Maybe stubborn things which cause us to sting. You know, this cycles of sin, defeat. And you're saying, you know, where will I get out of it? If by the Spirit you put to death, which means he's just bringing into, you know, our uh, bringing into the whole realm of possibility, saying it is possible to do this. It is possible to live a life like this. It is possible to put to death the things of the body, the fleshly appetites of the body, things which actually cause you to live in frustration. Right? You know, as a believer, if you live a life of sin, it's so frustrating. It's very frustrating because you know that you're not called to live like that. You know the promises. You know that hey, I can. my identity is not this. I'm actually called to live a higher life. You've experienced a little bit of that. But then if you continue to go back to be held captive by the things of the flesh, it's a very frustrating thing. It's like, oh God, what is this? Why? You ask all those questions. Why again? You know, I've asked forgiveness so many times. Why? Why am I going? Why am I going back? But here, you know, we see this: by the Spirit, you can. By the Spirit, you can. So I think we need to say, by the Spirit, I can. Now, can you say that out loud? By the Spirit, I can. I, I can, and I will. I put to death the deeds of the flesh, deeds of the body that I will live. Okay, so so this is some a wonderful promise, and uh, and, and yeah, I just see all the comments here. Thank you, Krishna, Shaya. Yeah, so um, we are putting to, we are able to put to death the things of the body, things of the flesh, because of the work of the Holy Spirit. And Galatians also we see the similar thing. You know, let's go to Galatians six and verse eight. 
Okay, Galatians 6 and verse 8. Okay. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap correct corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So the Holy Spirit enables us to sow to the Spirit in the things, in the sense he's saying, you know, when you sow, you reap something, right? When you sow, what happens when you sow? Maybe you sow a seed, you plant something, right? There is an expectation, you know that thing will come up, right? Sooner or later, it will it will come out of the soil. Yeah, I remember my brother and I we used to, my mother, you know, showing, okay, you plant this onion and it will come out. Okay. So every day, what we did was we used to dig up. <laughs> we plant it and we used to dig up and see whether it's growing. You know, they said, no, that's not how it's going to work. You put it, cover it with soil, leave it. Okay. One day it will just, those leaves will come out. So leave it. So the thing is this the reality is that it will, you will reap. Now, scripture is very clear, you know, if you sow to the spirit, there will be consequence. Sorry, there will be, you know, whichever it is, if you sow the spirit, or if you sow to the flesh, there will be a result, there will be a consequence of it. The consequence will be great, you will reap of everlasting life if it is, you are sowing to the spirit. But if you are sowing to the flesh, the consequence will be death. Okay. In the sense, you know, uh, death in all realms, right? physical, sometimes we think, okay, you know, the sin and the thing, and I'm just continuing in this lifestyle of sin, nothing will happen. I'm sure God will forgive me. No, it has its consequence. There are certain things that are dying, right? There are certain truth that God put in our heart that is that has been taken away. Maybe there are certain dreams, there are certain things that desires that God put in uh, that was alive, but now that's dead. And what causes that to die? It is sin. Right? So uh, sin brings death. Sowing to the flesh brings death, R brings corruption. Okay? Everything gets tainted by sin. Okay? But if we sow to the Spirit, we will reap everlasting life. So that's what we see here. So which means the work of the Holy Spirit is so important for each one of us. We need the Holy Spirit. But the other thing is, it's not automatic. Many times we think, no, this is automatic. You know, I become a believer and I'm doing, you know, I'm just there, I'm just walking around and, you know, it needs to be automatic. No, it requires your will. It requires your choice. God is never going to override that, overrule that. Okay, okay let's, um, uh, let's move on to something else. The sanctifying work of the Spirit. Okay, Romans 15 and verse 16. Romans 15 and uh, verse 16. What does it say? It says um, that I, I, is it Romans 15, 16? Yeah. Okay. That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What does sanctify mean? I think we looked at it, right? What does sanctify mean? To set apart, okay. So, so can you just explain that? What is set apart? Sorry, to make it holy, okay. Special for a purpose, okay. Okay. Anything else? Any other understanding? Sanctifying, clean, okay. Right. Yeah, so all, all, all this is uh, you know very very valid uh, way of looking at it. You know, practically, if you'd see, um, I just wanted to talk about uh, you know one, I don't know if you had this experience. You know, when you go on the highway, okay, like I go uh, to my hometown, uh, um, which is about seven hours away from here. So when I go on the highway, you stop by and you have you know some something to eat. You know, like a dosa, typically a dosa or something. Um, you know, you peep into the kitchen. You know, these are not great places. Now, you, of course, you have some very nice restaurants, you know, very nice places where you can. But if you look, you know, typically like a shack, you know, thatched roof kind of thing. 
and uh, the food is yummy right um, so you stop there and then you uh, you you say okay sit there order a dosa and then you're waiting for the dosa you just peep into the kitchen okay <laughs> now that's a wrong thing to do <laughs> but you peep into the kitchen and you will see this tawa tawa or you know it's like one big thing right many dosas can be you know uh, flying at the same time it's a big thing and then you'll see the the chef okay this guy will call out oh, two dosa two masala dosa for table one okay and uh, the chef will take one jadu <laughs> take a broom and you're like oh he's taking a broom and he'll put some water on the tawa and he'll take that broom and then sweep the water out right and you're just hoping i hope he uses the broom only for that <laughs> if he uses the broom for anything else gone you know your know, stomach is gone but the thing is that jadu is used only for cleaning the tawa hopefully <laughs> that's our faith but that's the thing it's used only for that it's used only for cleaning the tawa. so if you have that picture that gives us a picture of sanctification it can be used for various purposes but it's been made special for that only so that's a picture of set apart you know uh, well yeah it can be used to clean very th different things but god says hey i've sanctified you for this purpose you know i've taken you out out of something and i have set you for something right out of and for right i've taken you out of something i've taken you for something and it says that um self okay yeah uh so so that's that's sanctifying right so the work of the holy spirit here you know we see here that um, it is it is done by the holy the sanctification is done by the holy spirit which means that the holy spirit constantly if we would talk to him if we would allow him you know if we, if we would be friends with the holy spirit right um you know when when you say you know we are talking about the triune god of course so you know no need to get confused technical and saying you know do i talk to jesus or do i talk to holy no if we would be friends with god you know he would lead us in this path of sanctification he would say okay you know why don't you just you know why are you listening to this stuff don't listen to it why are you looking at this don't look at this you know, it's not helping you right uh, and and he would also say it's not just saying okay you give up something right we think oh if i become a believer oh god all fun is gone you know give up give up give up give up finally at the end you know all the, i have a big list of giving up no he's also saying you take on certain things right you do this you know why don't you do this it's an exciting life you know why don't you go on this adventure it's an exciting life it's a work of sanctification that the holy spirit does right and he does it so well in our lives if we would hear if we would listen okay let's look at 1 corinthians 6 and verse 11 okay um i'm not i'm not I, we won't be able to go and look at every verse uh, but i uh, just encourage you to read through the scriptures right uh, 1 corinthians 6 and verse 11 okay it says um about the corinthian believers paul is writing and you know this is how you were okay um so he's saying um but such were some of you and he's actually listed down a few you know um role descriptions you know fornicators idolaters adulterers homosexuals sodomites thieves covetous drunkards revilers extortioners and then verse 11 he says but such were some of you you guys were like this some of you but you were washed but you were sanctified but you were justified in the name of the lord jesus and by the spirit of our god okay look at the things that they were sanctified from okay it's a it's a deadly list right but they were sanctified by the work of the holy spirit right now justification uh, happens you know at an instant 
we accept Christ, we are made right with God, and justification just happens. We are justified by God. I think you've been studying in you know in Christ uh, class, you know identity. We are justified in an instant, but this work of sanctification happens throughout with our friendship with God. Throughout, you know, maybe you know the certain things that you know you thought were okay maybe five years back. Now you feel that hey, I don't think so. You know, I don't think so. I've grown with God. You know, I've grown in friendship with God, and uh, you know, and uh, I don't want to displease Him. I don't want to grieve God's spirit. Right? The sanctification is a is a walk with God, is a is a walk of friendship, walk of intimacy with God. Right. So it says here, but you were sanctified, uh, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So. He's doing this work of sanctification. You know, other scriptures also talk about that. Okay. Let's look at another aspect, okay? that we are temple of God. We are a temple of God. Right? We are a habitation of God. Okay? Now, um, if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 6, it talks about you know, this very thing. Here, okay, 1 Corinthians 3 and um, verse 16. Okay, what does it say? Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Okay, let's move on to chapter 6 and verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own okay so these two th there's one basic difference in these two verses okay and um, if you look at it in the context you know one thing is very clear that we are the temple of god okay but in these two verses there's one basic difference which is this 1 corinthians 3 talks about collectively the people he's, a, he's addressing a people if you look at 1 corinthians 3 you know he's saying i could not speak to you as carnal, uh, as spiritual, but I, I had to address you as carnal people. He's talking to a, like, let's say a classroom, right? He's, he's talking to a group of people, a bunch of people, and he's saying, don't you know that you are the temple of God? Meaning, collectively, the Holy Spirit inhabits us. Collectively. Right? Uh, we, are, we are house of God. We are the temple of God. And in chapter 6, verse 19, he says specifically, do you not know that your body, okay, individually, separately, you know, as a person, that my body, he's saying that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying specifically, you are individually a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, the thing is this, that, um, you know, we understand this concept theoretically, but uh, it needs to really sink in as a revelation right because the thing is that uh, we our body is the temple of the holy spirit which means he indwells us which means he is with us and um, you know for the first time i actually you know kind of thought about it this 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 truth um you know became a reality or uh, i could understand it i was so excited I was so excited i couldn't sleep all night it was like that because the thing is I was thinking of Genesis 1. Right? The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth. Okay. I was thinking about all through scripture, you know, the Spirit of God helping people, the Spirit of God causing, you know, all these miracles and everything to the same the Spirit of God coming upon the prophets and giving them revelation, understanding. I was coming to, I was thinking about Acts chapter 2 and the Spirit of God outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, and wonderful things happening, and right through the book of Acts and and uh, and and all these things, and I'm th I'm thinking, you know, this Holy Spirit. It's not a different Holy Spirit. Same Holy Spirit indwells me, and I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, the house of the Holy Spirit. Just think about it. It's not the same. It's not a different Holy Spirit. It's not a junior Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, it's the same Holy Spirit. God indwells us. So I was, I was really excited. Oh, wow. So this Holy Spirit who was there at creation is in me. 
this holy spirit who was there when the church was born is in me so there's nothing that he does not know because he is god there's nothing that is more powerful than him because he is omnipotent there's nothing that you know that escapes his attention and he is my god which means that i can we can depend on him right so that changes the way we would behave with someone else right? so that, which means that hey the same holy spirit who dwells in me if i'm a believer the same holy spirit dwells in you you are a believer you're a child of god and right? he dwells in you so it's not like he's you know any uh, any less no same holy spirit you might be educated uneducated skilled unskilled you know it doesn't matter the same holy spirit dwells you so yeah, i better watch out the way i behave uh, you might be older than me younger than me doesn't matter right so the same same holy spirit and you are the temple of the holy spirit so physically how i treat you emotionally how i treat you you know how i behave with you i need to be careful right because you are the temple of the holy spirit and the same also holds through collectively collectively you know uh, doesn't matter whether one is a believer you know as a minister of god wow world renowned travel here there you know, doesn't matter collectively you know people are gathered they are the temple of the holy spirit and so paul says you be careful if anyone defiles the temple god is not going to be pleased right okay so do we have time we have one more minute okay um so we see that we are the temple of the holy spirit okay i think i guess we'll stop here we'll take a break and when we come back we we'll look at uh, other chapter defile means to make it dirty yeah both so so here in in, in uh, okay the question was uh, what what is meant by defiling you know these 17 okay so i'll just uh, address this uh, defiling um so defiling is uh, to yeah i think the same question which nina is asking um defiling the temple so what is happening in the corinthian church is that people were actually fighting with one another people were uh, you know there was a lot of strife there was a lot of division and they were saying paul is great apollos is great peter is great and uh, there was a lot of division in the body okay so which means that they were treating each other you know they one group was looking down on the other group one group was saying we are greater and you are not and so um so here paul is saying that you know if you're doing that you are actually defiling the temple you know you are not treating the way they supposed to be treated you, know, you are the body of god body of christ sorry but then you are defiling you know it's like you are treating it as a common thing and you say you know especially when it's something um like sacred and you treat like the jadoo example no you take the jadoo and you use it to sweep the maybe the bathroom you know you do, you are actually defiling it right so so that's the thing so he's saying god is not pleased if anyone would defile you know in terms of spiritual abuse in terms of uh, you know misuse of spiritual authority everything god is not pleased okay so nina nina hope that helps okay nina's question is will god destroy that person <laughs> okay so the thing is um uh, will god destroy him well my opinion is this that god will give thousand and you know one chances for that person to change right for that person to come back because our god is a redeemer but the thing is if he does not in the end the person opens his life or her life for destruction anyway right um so that is my opinion yeah so that's what the scripture says you're right you're right that um, god uh, uh, scripture also says that he saves it which means that when we hold both intention he you know he saves the uttermost um he is going to give ample chances like this particular case you know for the church in corinth um god is actually giving them another chance giving them an opportunity to change uh, and this was through the ministry of paul like paul is saying you know this is this how serious it is uh, and then they repented they changed right so 
yeah. Okay, hope that helps, uh, Nina. Okay, uh, we can come back for some more questions. Okay, it's nine fifty-two, so we'll come back at ten too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>